right, well, good morning and welcome to Holy Trinity Church. Again, if you're here for the 11 a.m. service, I want to go ahead and, and encourage you to find a seat. Uh, if you were here for the 9, you're welcome to stay again for the 11, or you can go to lunch. It's your choice. Um, let's just see how many people we've got here. I'm just going to go ahead and say good morning. Good morning. Okay, that was actually much better than 9 a.m. Um, I just want to say, if this is your first time at Holy Trinity Church, or you've only been coming here for a handful of Sundays, uh, we just want to extend a warm welcome to you and say that we're very grateful you chose to, to join us and worship this morning. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you. But also, if you've been coming here for, for many years, maybe you've been a part of Holy Trinity for a decade plus, uh, we're no less grateful that, that you chose to join us this morning for worship. Um, and as, as I call us to worship this morning for our 11 o'clock service, uh, I just want to briefly remind you of what it is that we do together when we gather as a church. Uh, we are the church of God. We are a group of Christians who proclaim a story. We proclaim a story to one another and to our city when we gather together here on Sunday morning. And um, what you may not know is that you have a role in the story of God and his people. Um, when we gather together on Sunday mornings, we hear great stories of what this morning we'll hear the story of Moses. Uh, in this Advent season, we hear the story of the coming of Jesus to our world. Uh, those are all stories within the greater story of God and his people, but you also have a, a role in the story of God and his people. Uh, in the book of Acts, when Jesus leaves his disciples to ascend into heaven, he says to them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so they were tasked with carrying on the story of God and his people to the ends of the earth. And uh, that's where we're at today. You may not think of Chicago as the ends of the earth, but we are the ends of the earth people that Jesus was talking about in the book of Acts. And uh, I imagine that the disciples in their mind's eye could have never imagined or thought of a place like Chicago in the year 2023 being a place that was entrusted with proclaiming and carrying out the story of God and his people. Uh, and yet, they faithfully passed along the story so that now we, some 2,000 years later, can also carry out and proclaim that story. That's what we've been entrusted with here at the ends of the earth. And so whether you're here this morning uh, from a neighborhood like Pilsen or a neighborhood like Lincoln Park or a neighborhood like Kenwood or a neighborhood like Little Italy or whatever it may be, you are at the ends of the earth as one of God's witnesses and disciples entrusted with proclaiming his story. That's what we do when we gather here together. So I want to ask you all to stand as we prepare our hearts for worship. And I'm just going to briefly remind you from Psalm 111 what the story is that we declare this morning and as the church of God here in Chicago. This is what we gather to do. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. This is the story that we declare together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and sing together. Let's sing about the coming of Christ together. Let's sing, come that long, expect Jesus. And come thou long, expect Jesus, born to set his people free from our fears and sins. Release. 
Jesus, let us find our rest in Thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth Thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing to deliver born a child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom reign by thine own eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone by thine all sufficient and wear it raise us to thy glorious throne you come to earth you come to earth to taste our sadness he whose glories knew no end and by his life he brings us gladness our redeemer shepherd friend leaving riches without number born within a cattle stall is the everlasting wonder Christ was born the beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. When my sin was great, your love was greater. And what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. No rival, you have no equal now and forever. God, you reign. Yours is 
Good morning, Holy Trinity Church. We are going to com- continue our worship by stating the words of the Apostles' Creed. So if you're new here and this is your first time hearing it, basically, we're just going to continue to worship God by reciting who we recall him to be, what he has done, and what he is going to continue to do. And so, Christian, will you continue worshiping with me? What do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, and our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, now you can be seated, and I'm going to welcome up Christian. Well, good morning again. Uh, My name is Christian Park, and I'm the Director of Intentional Christian Communities. And over the last year, we had the the great joy of commissioning uh, two ICCs of Lawndale and Pilsen. And this morning, we have this very special opportunity to commission another ICC. So everyone, a part of the Wicker Park ICC, can you please come forward? If you live in Humbleport Park, Logan Square, Bucktown, and the surrounding areas, you're also included in these ICCs. An ICC, or an intentional Christian community, is an organically formed group of people who live out life together uh, to spur one another on towards living like Jesus Christ. There's something beautiful that happens when you live in close proximity with, with another household or, or people. Like uh, imagine you're baking that special cake and you're out of sugar. You know, you could knock on somebody's door and get that sugar. Or if you're out of, if you just poured your bowl of cereal and you're like, I don't have milk. <laughs> you could go, go again to neighbor. Or if, if you just want to hang out and watch the game together or if you have a a need for prayer requests, it's so beautiful to have your community or another person living within walking distance to you. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. The believer feels no shame, as though he were still living too much in the flesh when he yearns for the physical presence of other Christians. But if there's so much blessing and joy, even in a single encounter of brother with brother or sister with sister, how inexhaustible are the riches that open up for those who by God's will are privileged to live in the daily fellowship of life with other Christians. We want this incomparable joy to be recognized today by commissioning Wicker Park as an intentional Christian community who have covenanted or promised that they will live out the way of Jesus today in their community, their households, their neighborhoods. And, and so uh, 
Jenny Matthew ha has graciously offered to answer a couple questions about uh, what it means to be a part of this ICC. So, uh, first question, how long have you been part of the Wicker Park ICC? A little over two years. A little over two years. Well, and what is one reason why you are thankful for this ICC? Um, it's exactly what you quote, quoted, Christian, uh, just being proximate to other believers. I've lived in the city for over a decade um, and can say that this is the most community and connection I've experienced in the city. Um, and so, yeah, just, just an encouragement to have friends who are down the street, to run into people in the neighborhood, um, and just to know that we're all pursuing Christ together. Amen. And this is just one story of, of what an ICC does. And so our challenge to you is this. When your lease is up, move within five to 10 minutes walking distance to another person in this congregation. It could be Worker Park, it could be someone else. But plant roots, build community, build your family in these areas, build these relationships. So we see these things exemplified in this ICC in particular. You know, we, we see these groups. I, I, I've had some conversations where people actually did when their leases were up. They look for some place in Wicker Park because there's such a tight-knit community here. So please feel free uh, to talk one of these, to one of these people and, and see what else is great about Wicker Park. I think you've heard about restaurants and stuff like that. They're pretty good here too. Um, so, but there is also, after this service, there's gonna be a luncheon uh, with the South Loop community. And, and we're gonna also discuss what it means to have an ICC in that community. So if you live in the South Loop, or you're thinking about another place to live, maybe South Loop is a place for you. So please also join us in that conversation, that'd be great. At this time, I would like to invite uh, John up to pray for the ICCs and also, uh, all the elders, if you could come up as well, as well as if you have a, a close connection with one of these people and you want to pray for them, please come up forward as well. Yeah, don't be shy. We do need a few people to come and to just put their hands on this community here to set them aside and kind of consecrate them this morning. So a few of you just come on forward. Uh, Seth and Susie, can you guys please come up here and put your hands on them? Let's we'll start calling people out. Let's, um, come on, you guys. This community, uh, this intentional Christian community, really started just with about six people about four years ago, covenanting, to get, covenanting together to do life together. So, um, yeah, let's just be in prayer about what God might be doing in other parts of the city. Will you bow with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you've called us to be a people called us to be your nation within this city, to be a city within the city. And we thank you for the theology that holds to the idea that the city of God is at work in the city of man. So in this city that's so broken and so pained and corrupted in many ways, we pray that you would build a new redemptive people within and for those this morning who are lacking in relationship and community, we pray that you'd put them in with others that will love them and know them. We pray for these individuals in Wicker Park and Humble Park and uh, Logan Square and some of the other areas. Ask that the, your spirit would be on them as they speak with their neighbors, as they celebrate who Jesus is, as they walk in the way of Jesus in the heart of the city, in this day. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Also at this time, uh, why don't we all rise and greet those around us.
Well, hey, good morning again, and welcome to HTC. I want to invite you guys to, sadly, wrap up conversations. I know it's great to see people. Grab a seat as we continue in our worship service this morning. Well, once again, good morning and welcome to Holy Trinity Church on this Sunday morning. My name is David Engstrom. I am a pastoral resident here at the church and just want to add my welcome to the welcomes that have already been given this morning. We're, we're so glad to be gathered in the space, worshiping together uh, to our great God this morning. Um, I want to offer a special welcome to you if you are new to Holy Trinity Church or visiting for the first time. We are especially glad glad that you are here, and we would love to get connected, get to know you. Um, I want to invite you, if you are new especially, but also if you are not new, um, to fill out the connection card that's at the bottom of the bulletin or on our pillars here. We've got a QR code you can scan. Um, this is a way that you can let us know that you are here, let us know how we can be praying for you, how we can get you further connected into the life of the church. Um, so I want to encourage really everybody, to, to take advantage of that, to get connected that way this week. Um, I want to share briefly in these moments about a few upcoming events in the life of the church this month. We're in the full swing of Advent, heading rapidly towards Christmas, and a lot to be excited about in the coming weeks. First of all, I want to draw your attention to our Christmas concert, a downtown Christmas. Um, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Get excited. We've got a lot of hard work that has been put into this event, some really special music that we're going to be able to enjoy. That is here in our space next Sunday evening, uh, December 17th at 5.30, this, this great time of music and worship and fellowship together. Um, so I want to invite you to, um, you can get your ticket online for that. It is a, a ticketed event. You have to, to sign up in order to come. Um, spots are limited, so I encourage you all to take advantage of that as soon as possible. We'd love to have so many of you here for that. Well, also, as we're making our way through this season of Advent, there's a special resource that we want to make available to you. That is our uh, Christmas in the Psalms Advent devotional. So some of you, many of you probably had a chance last week as we kicked this off to um, find that online. We also have little paper week-by-week -week booklets that you can grab by the doors here and, and go through uh, devotionals that are staff from both our Northside congregation here downtown have prepared sort of day by day um, to give some reflections on, on the Psalms in this season of anticipation of Christ's birth, this sort of special way day by day to um, go slowly and really acknowledge and appreciate some of the meaningfulness of the season. If you haven't been going through these day by day yet, it's not too late. <laughs> Grab one, find it online, and we encourage you to, to uh, make the most out of this resource that's available for you. Lastly, I just want to draw your attention to our worship services that are scheduled around the holidays. So, Leading up to Christmas and around New Year's, we're going to have just one service on Christmas Eve at 10.30 that day, and then one service on New Year's Eve Sunday, uh, December 31st. So those Sundays, we'll, we'll gather together still Sunday morning as we do one service, um, and look forward to seeing those of you who are able to be there at those. Um, at this time, we're going to continue in our service with our Advent readings, so I want to invite up um, Hannah, who will be leading us in that. <clears throat> A reading from Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Today, we relight the candle of hope and expectation. Let this candle remind us of the great hope we have in Christ, the Messiah, and in God's promises. 
The second candle is the candle of preparation and peace. Let it remind us to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. Okay. Join me in prayer. Father, guide us in confession of our sins. We know that in the greatness of your love, you have promised to forgive us. Cleanse us as we prepare our lives for the coming of Jesus again. This we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Let's stand and continue in our worship together. And at this time, uh, any kids who are here are dismissed for Kid City. Let's sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, like the whole chapter, the book of Exodus, chapter 3. And if you all could go ahead and remain standing for the reading of God's word. Exodus, chapter 3. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. 
He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus am I to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord, our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. You may have a seat. Good morning. Welcome again to Holy Trinity Church on this uh, second Sunday of Advent. Hope you're feeling ready for this holiday season that is coming up. Anticipation. If there's one word that describes the Advent season and the Christmas season, that could be the word. 
anticipation. Children anticipate opening of gifts. They see the gifts with their eyes and can't wait for their little fingers to open them. I don't know if you remember that. As a child, I do. Hosts anticipating the welcoming of guests because actually Christmas is fairly universally celebrated. Offices celebrate Christmas. Stores, maybe they have mixed motives, but celebrate Christmas. Christians celebrate Christmas. Our our children anticipate Christmas. People who are hosting celebrate Christmas. And uh, the hurting uh, anticipate Christmas. The, The pain of celebration. There's somebody perhaps that was at the table a number of years ago who will not be at the table again. Or for those of you who have unhealed memories with various family members, those things are exposed and raw as you come to the season of Christmas. There's an anticipation there. But there's another group of people that anticipates, and I'm going to call them the hungry. Not so much the physically hungry, but the, those who are hungry for something that's deeper a purpose, a sense of meaning, or even hope, or joy, or forgiveness. Those who are hungry anticipate Christmas. They're anticipating the welcoming of God into the world, just as Mary welcomed a son into the world, as the Jews were promised a Savior, and as the world has been promised salvation through this infant, Anticipation is a word that summarizes what this season is about. But probably the most proper or biblical or historical way to think about anticipation is not those things, not gifts, not grief, not anticipating people coming to our homes, but the anticipation of a deliverer. Someone who will deliver us from the things that we need to be delivered from. The song that we sang a moment ago, what does it say? Born thy people to deliver. Born thy people to set free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. May you find rest in this season of celebrating Christmas. The anticipation of Jesus and of Moses have this in common. They both anticipate a delivery. They both anticipate deliverance. Jesus was born to deliver us from our sins, and Moses was born to deliver his people from their slavery. Moses was born into this moment of genocide and terror and oppression. And Jesus, likewise, was born into this moment of terror and genocide and oppression when Herod was slaughtering the youngest. But in the same way that the birth of Jesus anticipates the birth... Let me say that again. The birth of Jesus is anticipated by the birth of Moses. So also the calling of Moses anticipates the calling of Jesus. And today we have this most magnificent passage, that one of the most powerful images of God calling someone in all the Scripture. Isaiah, you remember him being called in this moment where he sees these angels singing, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You remember Mary being specifically called to, to bear this child and being spoken to by an angel. Ruth being called to be with Naomi. Peter, James, and John, all of them called. But this image of a burning bush is marked into our memories as a as a moment in history you can think of it this way that before god births a nation as he's going to do in the book of exodus he's birthing a leader before he fashions this delivery he's taking this leader and forming him we have this bush that is present and not consumed, but we also have this name that is above every other name. 
What I want to show you in a sentence today is this, that the God of the burning bush is also the God of the Savior's birth. That the God of the burning bush is also that God of the Savior's birth that we'll see in the passage. And all I want to show you today is just I'm going to draw out four things from the four scenes that are here in this passage of how Moses' calling anticipates Jesus' calling. And they go like this. There's the appearance of God where God appears in the bush. There's the mission of God that's given over to Moses. So appearance and then mission and then the nature of God that's revealed in this divine name when God's name is revealed here. And then the power of God, the way that God says that you can trust that I will indeed bring you out of this land of Egypt. So his appearance, his mission, his nature, and then his power. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, some of us here today are hurting. Some of us have unhealed memories and trauma associated with the ones that are closest to us. And some of us have loved ones that have departed and will not be at the dinner table this holiday season. And some of us are hosting and welcoming others in and we need to remember your love and your joy as we create an environment for other people. And some of us are giving gifts and need resources. And some of us want to care for the hungry and we don't know how to. But today, Lord, at the burning bush, may we see an, again a vision for who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Verses 1 to 7 are the appearance of God to Moses. And at the bush, God mysteriously appears and reveals himself and his will. Take a look at verse 1 on the appearance of God. What you see there in verse 1 as we read, it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law, Jethro the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. That's a pregnant sentence right there, okay? Because if you look at the first, the the 14 verses that precede this, a lot has happened. Moses commits murder. Moses gets married in just a few. This is like, you know, if you're ever watching an episode, and I know most of you don't watch episodes, but it's like, do you want to see the recap? You know, and if you don't, then you just push skip, right? Previously in Exodus, like previously on West Wing. And what happens in this passage is that Moses sees someone, chapter 2, verse 11, he sees one of his own people. He's grown up as this prince in Egypt, and he sees one of his own people being bludgeoned by somebody else. Someone's beating one of his people. And he looks this way and that, and he sees no one, verse 12, chapter 2, and he strikes down the Egyptian and he buries him. Like no one's going to find out what he did. But then the next day, someone comes and says, are you going to do the same thing to us today that you did yesterday? And he said, surely this thing is known. So he flees, flees and he goes to the the area of Midian, and there he finds a wife. And then you have this transitional section between chapter 2 and chapter 3 where the people are groaning in prayer. (laughs) They don't even have the words to say what they need to say, but their pain and their oppression is so deep that all they can do is utter groans. Verse 23, so during those many days, The king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue and from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. This is a way of the author and the promise-giving God saying that he's a promise-keeping God. That he sees the oppression of this world. That he sees the pain of his people. And he promises one day to relieve his people of their pain and oppression. And this book is about how he does that. Before God delivers a people, he develops a deliverer. Uh, Last week was on the, the birth of this 
um, this deliverer who's coming into the world. And this is on the calling and formation of that leader. And what God does is He uses this bush somehow in this moment of encounter, this appearance to form Moses. Now what's humorous here is it's not like Moses is looking for God. It's not like he's going to, you know, he's finding some little place where he can pull out his journal and like, you know, have a little quiet time with God. That's No. God just comes and finds him. The, the, the God of the Scriptures is a pursuing God. He sends his son. He calls the disciples. Um, it says here that he is a shepherd, actually. That's his occupation, which is interesting because he used to be a, uh, he used to be a prince. He's gone from being a prince in Egypt to a shepherd in Israel, which let me tell you, there's a different socioeconomic standing in that uh, situation. In fact, (laughs) the Scriptures are pretty clear in the book of Genesis that Egyptians hate shepherds. I don't know about current day Egyptians, but ancient uh, Egyptians hated them. Uh, In Genesis 43, it says, Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to Egyptians. In verse chapter 46, verse 34 of Genesis, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Now, God comes to this lowly shepherd in the form of an angel and calls this lowly shepherd to bring good news to his people. Feels a little bit like Luke too, doesn't it? Just a little bit of parallel, just a a little echo of what God is going to do. That is, He breaks open the sky in Luke chapter 2 when He's announcing the Deliverer who is to come. And He says, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. Some people say the reason why the the bush, the flame does not go out, it's it's a sign of the everlasting, eternal nature of God. He just exists. He's not dependent on anything. So other people say that it actually is kind of a, it is kind of a symbol that even as the bush is not consumed, so the people of Israel will not be consumed by the fires of their oppression that they are undergoing. It says Mount Horeb here, which is another name for Mount Sinai. That's a little foreshadowing because the book centers for most of the book around Mount Sinai when God meets again with fire and lightning, thunder, such that no one can even approach this mountain. Holiness. I just wanted you to pause for a moment if you're not really a follower of Jesus at the moment, not sure about these things, and I want you to think about how this world came into being, what your theory of creation is, how it came into being, and um, many people believe, yes, maybe God possibly exists as some force out there. You know, Aristotle called it the unmoved mover, like the first cause who is not caused, but causes all things. But what the Scriptures say is that the one who is the first cause is also a personal God. That He's not just a distant and detached and uh, impotent spiritual being, but He enters into history. He enters in and speaks to these leaders, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, He's so omnipresent. God is omnipresent, and yet somehow, even though he, he can hold all the universe in his hands and he's larger than un- the universe, he has a way of focusing sometimes and in inhabiting a small place, which is what he does here. It says that God is here speaking from the bush. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around it, but you can think of it this way, that when God wants to focus His presence in the world, He uses representatives. In other words, human beings are God's representatives on, in the vast universe on this tiny little blue dot. People are the representatives of God. Angels are the representatives of God from the heaven to the earth. And so here, this angel is representing God. 
God is limiting himself here to this small space in a way that's incomprehensible to us. Verse 4 says that God called out to him from the bush. Now it's God calling out. It's not really the angel calling out. And God says, Moses, Moses. Some scholars say that this double use of a name is a term of endearment, actually. It's, a, it's the double calling of endearment. Dearest, dearest, so to speak. It's a way of showing his concern and intimacy with Moses. And notice what happens next. The Scriptures say that no one can look on the face of God and live. They will. Why is that? Because God is this consuming holiness. And so when Moses encounters what you might call the astounding presence of God, he also encounters the astounding holiness of God. Verse 5, God warns him and says, don't come near. That's the holiness of God. Same thing happens with the mountain later in Exodus 19 and 20. God says, no, build some fences. Build some fences in case somebody like stumbles to the base of the mountain and is consumed. This holy God says, don't come near. In fact, take off your sandals from your feet for the place that you're standing on is holy ground. Some places, when you go over to someone's house, you respectfully remove your shoes. Imagine coming into the presence of God and feeling like, give me some small act to show reverence and respect and honor. You cannot enter lightly into the presence of God. I love this little phrase at the end of verse 6. And it says, and Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. You see, children do that sometimes. If a parent is angry or they're fearful, what do they do? They just hide their face. That's Moses. like, you can't see me. I'm still here, but you can't find me. He's afraid to look at God. You see, the revelation of God in the Old Testament foreshadows and anticipates the revelation of God in the New Testament. The Old Testament, God comes in fire and in a cloud and in wind and in creation. And then in the New Testament, He comes not in fire, but in flesh. We can't see God. We can't look at God. And so, God veils Himself in this fire. And He veils Himself when Jesus comes in the flesh. So that we can't... That's why the Scriptures say in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. We've seen His glory. Glory of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. God tabernacles in the flesh because we cannot lay our eyes on the One who is so holy that He would consume us. So the appearance of God anticipates Jesus because in Exodus, God mysteriously reveals Himself not fully, not as a human, but just in fire. That's the appearance of God which anticipates the birth of Christ, but also not only does the appearance of God anticipate the call of Jesus, but also God's mission for Moses anticipates the birth and calling of Jesus. This is verses 7 to 12. This is like the mission of Moses, which anticipates the mission of Jesus. And they're parallel. Moses' liberation is from slavery. Jesus' liberation is from sin. The slavery of sin. And just as Moses is going to draw out a people and create a new people. Jesus is intentionally drawing out a new people, an ecclesia, a church, a community that will be an eternal community that will be His own precious possession, a new people to inhabit the the, the world and to live in a new way in the power of the Spirit. Look at how the mission unfolds in verse Seven, then the Lord said, I have surely seen, listen to the verbs, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry 
because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. And I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt and to bring them up. God's making a, a God who made a promise is saying, I still see you. I know where you are. I know what you're suffering. The nouns are interesting too. Verse 7, Then the Lord said, I surely have seen the affliction of My people in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. Verse 9, Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to Me. And I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. You see, it's so easy for us to feel like God is unhearing and unseeing and uncaring and unknowing because we are in, a, some of us are in affliction and suffering and pain. And we feel like, man, decades go by and God doesn't do anything. And in this passage, decades have gone by. Moses is 40 by this time. We don't know how long it has been that they've been in Egypt. We do know that 430 years they're going to be there. 430 years they've been oppressed. God cares about the impression of His people and cares about their cries. And He's going to do something. It's true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament. Just as He sends God Moses as a deliverer. He's going to send Jesus as a deliverer. Look at the promise in verse 8. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out into a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. For Americans, we picture like jugs of milk and like those little containers of honey or something. Like, like what does that even mean? Right? Well, some people say that the, a goat is the poor man's cow and this land will be full of goats where you can get milk to drink. Uh, that, that in, we think of honey as coming from bees, which it does, but the word here can also refer to that oozy substance that comes out of dates or figs. And it's said that nomads can live for months on just goat's milk and dates. You would die, but other people can do it, right? So that's the land that he's going to bring them to. And he says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people out of, bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. The mission's pretty clear. But as often happens, just because there's a mission doesn't mean that people feel prepared to execute the mission. <laughs> he's got some questions for God. He's got two questions in this passage, one question in the next passage. But his questions are like, well, who am I? You're, wait, you want me to go to the king, the pharaoh, and tell him we're leaving? That's what you want me to do? Who, who am I? But then also like, who are you, God? Like that, you know, sometimes we call this the imposter syndrome. Imagine the imposter syndrome if you had to go talk to the most powerful person in that community and tell them, watch out. It would be a challenge. So God gives them a promise. He gives them a sign. What's hilarious about this sign is that it won't be fulfilled until the whole battle is over. <laughs> he, says, he says, verse 12, I will be with you and I'm going to give you a sign. Here's the sign that I, that I have sent you. Here's how you'll know that I've been sent. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, then you shall serve God on this mountain here. I'd be like, I want a new sign that's like, can we have our money back on that sign? Because this doesn't seem like much of a help. But Jesus has a sign also, and that is that the, the sign that one day everyone will know that God has sent him is when he delivers his people from the mountains of this world to the mountains of the next world. There's a day when everyone's going to know and see that sign. That's the mission here is to deliver. And his appearance is this physical manifestation in the world. And what's next is his nature or his name. I, I, I want you to see his nature and name here. Um, Moses is wondering what they would do if they want to know who sent them. Then verse 13 it says, Then Moses asked God, if I come to this people and say to them, the God of your fathers sent me, and they ask me what's his name, what shall I say to them? I mean, that's kind of natural. Like, I've been sent. 
by a divine being. What's his name? I have no idea. But he spoke to me, and he told me to go. What's his name? You get one of the most profound statements in all literature in verse 14. I was thinking this week, like, I don't know if somebody could even, could you even make this up? Like, the, the intensity and conciseness of thought in this one little phrase. So God says his name. This is the tetragrammaton, the, the four unsayable letters in the Hebrew alphabet, Yahweh. Modern, contemporary Jews, ancient Jews don't say that name. It's too holy. It seems like it's profaning the very name. So God said to Moses, listen to this, I am who I am. You might still feel like, like that's not that much help. right? Go to them and tell them who sent you and just say, he is who he is. Okay? But what does that mean? It means a few things. It means that how would you define God? How can you define God except to say that God is God? He is the ancient one, the only one. He's self-defining. You cannot fully or even partially describe God. He just is. He is. You want to argue about whether or not God exists? He is. He says, I am. He's self-defining. He's also underived. God doesn't derive himself from something else. Everything else derives itself from God. Everything else was in, before Moses was called, God knew Moses would be called. God planned Moses to be called. Everything is contingent upon him, proceeds from him because he is. He's the first and final brute fact. He is causation. He's self-defining, he's underived, and he's Eternal, it also means he's eternal. I just am. He is who he is. God is without beginning, without end. And Moses is saying, I'm just pointing to something in eternity, someone in eternity that has sent me here. The call of Moses anticipates that the eternal God, the underivable God, the inexplicable God is going to be born in human flesh. That the eternal one is going to become temporal. How can that be? That the immensity of God will be cloistered in Mary's womb. Jesus says to the religious leaders in John 8, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day and saw it was, and was glad. And so the Jews said to him, Wait a second, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, check this out, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's intentionally and blasphemously, if he's not God. They picked up stones to stone him at that moment. That's why the Gospel writer of John wants to weaves through all these statements. Not that Jesus gives bread or that Jesus gives life or that Jesus is like a shepherd. He says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I, he's indescribable other than taking earthly things and saying that bread emanates from Him. Life emanates from Him. Hope emanates from Him because He's hope and life. He's underived and indescribable. We sang a couple moments ago you were the word at the beginning one with god the lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our christ what a beautiful name it is god also said to moses verse 15 say this to the people of israel the lord the god of your fathers the god of abraham the god of isaac the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. Thus I'm to be remembered throughout all generations. And so today, the name of God is still Yahweh. Still, I am who I am. The revelation of God in the Old Testament anticipates the revelation of God in the New Testament. The mission of God in the Old Testament 
anticipates the mission of Jesus in deliverance in the New Testament and the eternality of God. Without beginning and without end, anticipates the eternality of the incarnate Son in the New Testament. Moses' calling anticipates the birth of Jesus in, his, in, in God's appearance to Moses, in the mission of, for Moses, in the nature of God, that also verse 16 to 22, in his power. He's got to prove to, doesn't have to prove, <laughs> he decides to prove to Moses that he can do this. Um, Verses 16 to 22 are all about the power of God. And what God is doing here is preparing Moses to meet with Pharaoh. But before he prepares him to meet with Pharaoh, he's trying to, he needs to go and convince all the elders. So he tells, God tells Moses in verse 16 specifically to gather the elders and to tell them, hey, do you remember the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? Guess what? He showed up and spoke to me. And now he told me to go. In verse 18, he's preparing to go to speak. In verse 19, it says, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled. Love these four words here by a mighty hand. How is Abraham, I mean, how is Moses going to have confidence? to deliver, because it's not actually Moses delivering, it is the mighty hand of God. Ezra, in chapter 7, verse 28 says, because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage. This is a symbol and an image of God's power to do anything. Think of Jesus when He comes into the world and the power of His hand, the power of His touch, to touch two eyes and heal. To take His fingers and put them in ears. Drill away and bring hearing back. This is the hand of God. 1 Peter 5-6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may lift you up in due time. What can the mighty hand of God do here? It's going to strike the Egyptians with wonders. This is the wonder-working hand of God. He's going to bring them from slavery to safety, but not just from safety from slavery to safety, but also safety to plunder. They're going to take this is kind of this is like the last little kind of touche to the Egyptians, like, and take their stuff when you leave, okay? They've been slaves, and now they're going to take the, 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 the stuff that they have worked for, in a sense. Look at verse 21, and I'll give this favor, I'll give these people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask her neighbor, and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold and jewelry and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so shall you plunder the Egyptians. And that's actually the picture of what happens in conversion and in faith. That people who are slaves become sons and daughters who are dressed in the regalia and the splendor of the King of Kings. The the God of the burning bush, is He is a God who appears. He's a God with a mission to set people free from oppression and slavery and sin. And He's an eternal God. The great I Am. He's also a powerful God. So this Advent season, I want you to just keep in mind that the God of this burning bush is the God of that Savior's birth that we keep singing about in our songs. It's the same God. It's not a different plan. It's the plan that was promised and is now revealed. And just as Moses saw God, let me tell you something, you're going to see God. And we have to be prepared to see Him. In the same way that for hundreds of years people anticipated the coming of an infant, now we 
anticipate the coming of Christ with a trumpet. In the same way that angels announce the coming of Jesus into the world, there's a day when the angels will announce He's back. And we'll see Him face to face. You'll be tempted like Moses to hide your face because of the blazing glory of God. And you'll need to prepare in reverence to meet Him. The God of the burning bush is the God of our Savior's birth and we will see Him face to face. Not only are you going to see Him face to face, one day you're going to hear His name. You're going to hear the name of the God that is beyond definition being sung. And the One who's worshipped in heaven. The God that's beyond comprehension. The God that is before all creation. And you'll hear His name being sung in different languages as people from every tribe and nation and tongue sing His name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. You'll see His face. You'll hear His name. And you will be delivered. For those of you who are in Christ, you'll be delivered from sadness and grief, depression, and abuse. And suffering. One day. Moses was on the earth to taste the sadness of His people. He saw it. That's what was happening to Him. His heart was broken and He said, i got to do something about this. And Jesus was on the earth to taste the sadness of His people. He could have just delivered us, right? He could have just said, okay, fine, you're all delivered. But instead, He comes and enters into the sadness, into the grief, becomes a man of sorrows, The infant king came to earth to taste our sadness. By his life, he brings us gladness. Not fully. Our Redeemer, Shepherd, Savior, and Friend. So, in this Advent season, prepare to see his face. Prepare to remove your sandals in his presence. Prepare to hear his name. And prepare to be delivered from sadness and fear fear and sin one day. The God of the burning bush is the God of this newborn Savior. So anticipate the gifts and welcome the guests and prepare for grief, but celebrate the Savior's birth and anticipate one day meeting the great I Am face to face. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in Heaven, we thank You that You will heal and redeem and shepherd us. We need a Savior and we need a friend. So in the midst of the waves that come for some of us of grief and pain and sadness, also, Lord, bring us some waves of gladness as we think of this Deliverer. That even as You called Moses through Your appearance, through your mission and through your power, that you called Jesus through your appearance and mission and power. And now you call us to go into the world. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and let's respond together in song. To shine brighter in us, so we man you well, God with us, our deliverer, you are Savior, in your presence we find our strength over everything, our redemption. 
with us. You are God with us. Oh, you've come to be whole to this world for your honor and name. Oh, you've come to take sin, to bear shame. And to conquer the grave, oh, we thank you well. God with us, our deliverer, you are Savior. In your presence, we find our strength over everything. Our You are God with us. You are here. You are holy. We are standing in your glory. Standing Sing that again. You are here, you are holy, and we are standing in your glory. You are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory. Savior, in your presence we find our strength over everything, our redemption, God, with us, our deliverer. good news he is here and he's holy and you're standing in his glory he's the great I am God with us there's a God who has no beginning and no end and he promises that what he has begun he will also bring to an end so may you walk in the prayer and the presence and the hope of a God without beginning or end who's come to redeem and deliver a people like you. Go in peace. like somebody to pray with you, there's some folks praying over there. If you need someone to pray with you, go over there.